Many of us are trying to find ways to build a more sustainable world for future generations. We're concerned that our planet's well-being isn't as secure as it once seemed. But on every continent, there are new environmentalists who are committed to change. Whether it's an individual, a small group, or a grassroots organization, they've made personal sacrifices that most of us couldn't even imagine. We do not have authority to be in our territory. The water they were drinking was poisoned. It was a really terrible situation that no one should allow another human being to live under. The mangroves play a critical role for protecting the coastline against storm surges and for protecting the coral reefs. But Haiti's mangroves are being cut down and turned into charcoal. We denounced this dam and were threatened with imprisonment and murder. But nobody heard our voices until we set up a roadblock. The new environmentalists, ordinary people affecting extraordinary change. Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, has been plagued by tragic natural disasters, rampant hunger, diseases, and pollution. John Wiener knows that these problems can be confronted by empowering the communities to protect their homeland's coastal resources, especially the drastically depleted forests and marine life. The fisheries sector in Haiti has been in trouble for several decades now. Overfishing, using inappropriate methods, not respecting fishing seasons. It's quite disturbing seeing the size of the fish that they're catching now. And they know that what they're doing is not good for the environment, it's not good for them, it's not good for the sustainability of the fisheries, but they have no other choice. Fisheries habitat in the mangrove forests and coral reefs were also degraded. The charcoal issue in Haiti is probably our biggest environmental issue. But this is Haiti's mangroves now, which are being cut down and turned into charcoal. The mangroves play a critical role as fish nurseries for protecting the coastline against storm surges and for protecting the coral reefs. More than 20 years ago, Wiener and his organization, the Foundation for the Protection of Marine Biodiversity, set out to establish Haiti's first marine protected area to safeguard the mangroves, the coral reefs, and the fisheries. Faced with persistent political instability in Haiti, Wiener focused on creating solutions to restore a healthier, more sustainable marine ecosystem. The group planted more than a million trees. Their education program emphasizes the critical need to protect the plants from being cut down for charcoal. This is part of our educational activities with the local community to make sure that they feel a sense of pride, that they planted these trees and that they will hopefully defend them from people who might want to cut them down. Wiener also launched efforts to restore degraded coral reefs, another key habitat for fish. We're trying to grow some of these corals, which are important for fisheries, just to give Mother Nature a helping hand. It's grown to five times of what it was when we started in about a year. So it's critically important to help manage these resources. In 2013, after 20 years of research, outreach, and lobbying by Wiener and the community stakeholders, the Haitian government finally declared Caracol Bay and Port Salud as Haiti's first two marine protected areas, securing formal protection for the mangroves, the coral reefs, and the fisheries. When I brought my children out here, they just felt a, a tremendous sense of pride in knowing that their father had helped establish this protected area for Haiti. But more importantly, I think at their age, they just thought it was something really cool, some place where they'll be able to maybe even take on the work after I'm gone. I think we're looking at something great for our future here.
I was born in a village near the Irrawaddy River Delta. I have always had a love for the river, which is the lifeblood of our people. Our culture depends on it. This sense of connection led me to become an environmental journalist. Known as one of the world's most repressive regimes, Myanmar's junta opened the door to foreign investments like the Chinese-backed Mieso Dam. This mega project would destroy forests, farmland, and fishing communities. 90% of the electricity generated would go to China. We were sad and angry when we learned that a dam was being built. The dam would flood the cultural heartland of the ethnic Kachin people. In 2009, when the construction of the dam began, thousands were moved to resettlement villages. If completed, the dam would displace 18,000 people and affect millions downstream. Media censorship was still quite strict in 2009. So journalists in the environmental movement were all trying to find a way to do something about the dam. I went to Mietzon and started taking photographs. To circumvent censorship of stories about dams, Mian Zha wrote about the negative impacts of dams in other countries. But he and his colleagues realized that they needed to go beyond journalism. We decided to use art galleries as places to share information. With the support of famous writers, visual artists, and musicians, Mian Zha created a series of art gallery exhibitions to overcome the military government's restrictions on public meetings. We were nervous during that first exhibit, so we only ran it for half a day. After our guests saw the show and heard our speeches, we quickly packed up and left. To intimidate and suppress us, the intelligence service would try to find out who was organizing these events then they'd place us under surveillance. We were distributing scientific data and educational materials without government permits. We were always worried about getting arrested. Despite these challenges, me and Zha organized three new shows called The Art of the Watership. He traveled around the country with the exhibitions and created support for what rapidly became a national movement. We knew we'd reached a tipping point when the entire country started talking about the dam. The exhibit was visited by members of parliament, government officials, and civil society leaders. Nearly 3,000 people attended. It was a message to the president that he must do something. Not long after that, the president announced he would suspend the Mietzon Dam. It was a very important turning point for Myanmar, where the people spoke and the government actually listened. It will be remembered in our history as a rare victory for civil society. This river has ancestral and spiritual importance to the Lenka people because it's inhabited by the female spirits. These female spirits guard the rivers. The Gualcarque River is also used for growing food and gathering medicinal plants. I believe it signifies life. After a military coup in 2009, the Honduran government awarded concessions for 47 dams to power hundreds of new mining projects. Chinese engineering giant Sino Hydro joined with the Honduran company to build a dam near Rio Banco. The Akozaka Dam would impact hundreds of Linka people. This was a violation of indigenous rights from the start because the National Congress granted a concession without providing free, prior, and informed consent. 
no es un crimen defender. Cuando entró la, esa compañía eh, Sino Hidro. When Sino Hydro came in, they ran their tractors all over our fields, destroying everything. We got mad. Then we decided to organize ourselves with Copin. Copian, an indigenous rights organization, organized the link-up around their internationally recognized rights. In more than 150 indigenous assemblies, our community decided that it did not want that hydroelectric dam. Berta filed complaints with the Honduran government and organized peaceful protests in the nation's capital. Muchas denuncias. We denounced this dam and were threatened with smear campaigns, imprisonment and murder. But nobody heard our voices until we set up a roadblock to take back control of our territory. For well over a year, the link up maintained the roadblock with standing harassment and violent attacks. Tragically, Rio Blanca community leader Tomas Garcia was shot by the Honduran military at a peaceful protest. Seeing this man murdered, the community became indignant, forcing a confrontation. The company was told that they had to get out. And that is how Sino Hydro left Rio Blanco. But it cost us in blood. Sino Hydro terminated its contract, citing ongoing community resistance. The World Bank later withdrew its funding over concerns about human rights violations. They can attack her, they can even kill her as they have tried. But her life transcends this moment in time. This struggle is a symbol of community resistance that inspires people across Honduras and around the world. No podemos ser ingenuos ante ese poder. Cuando iniciamos la lucha de Rio Blanco, when we started the fight for Rio Blanco, I would go into the river and I could feel what the river was telling me. I knew it was going to be difficult, but I also knew we were going to triumph, because the river told me so. When Phyllis Amido was hired to work for EPZ Metal Refinery, she was given the task of overseeing an environmental impact assessment on the smelting factory, which removed lead from used car batteries. She quickly learned that toxic emissions were having a devastating impact on the community that surrounded the factory. That was very heavy, thick, dark smoke. It was really, really bad. You could not stand the, the smell. So some of the children were passing out. The soil the children were working on was toxic. The water they were drinking was poisoned. It was a really, really terrible situation that no one should allow another human being to, to live under. Phyllis listened to the community's concern and began to raise objections with her employer about the egregious health conditions. But then the issue became intensely personal for her. My baby at that time was small and I was nursing him. He also felt sick and after some tests we discovered that he had a high blood lead levels. And that's the first time that I actually decided to confront the issue. Phyllis left her job at the refinery and formed the Center for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action and began compiling health records in the community. They randomly tested three children who had lead levels that were more than 20 times those of children in the U.S. Omido and her organization presented their findings to the Kenyan government. It was unacceptable that the government was watching these people live under that condition. We asked everyone in the community, all 3,000 of us, to go and present this case to the government. 
the community knows. Phyllis and the community were initially successful in their efforts to close down the factory. But within a month, the government gave the factory owners permission to reopen. As the emissions continued to envelop the community with toxins, the health hazards intensified. There were more than 300 prenatal and infant mortalities in the village of just 3,000. My oldest son was having trouble breathing. By the time we reached the hospital, they discovered that his kidneys were failing. It was too late. He died soon after. All of the hope I had for my firstborn son and his life is gone. Now I'm left to worry about my youngest children. Phyllis continued to mobilize the community to call attention to the dire health issues. Their protests resulted in more temporary shutdowns while the activists were beaten and arrested for alleged terrorist acts. In 2014, after Phyllis and her group had been acquitted and assured by the court of their right to protest, they again petitioned the national government. They presented their extensive medical findings to the Senate Committee on Health and demanded the factory cease operation permanently. Because of the violation that was done on the environment, the smelter shut down for good and they've not operated again. Even though the soil is still poisoned, the water is still poisoned, but at least the air is clean. Look at the kids, they are all grown up, including my son who is well now, but for some of the community members who are never treated, we still have an obligation to find a way to help them. The Namaya Valley in British Columbia is the ancestral homeland of the Chilcotin people. And at its heart is a gleaming jewel called Fish Lake. It's a very prime grizzly territory where the bears feed on the wild salmon. This is very pure, clean, unpolluted, glacial fed waters where some of the last people who can drink from our lakes. Marilyn Baptiste is a former chief of her remote First Nations community of 400, the Hanigwetin. My dad was chief before I was born. I've learned a lot from him about the values of protecting our lands. In 2008, Tosico Mines Limited targeted the area for development of a massive gold and copper mine. The open pit was proposed to be approximately three kilometers wide, and they were going to drain Fish Lake and have stockpilings there. So the entire area would have been destroyed. The provincial government planned to rubber stamp the development, so the Hunigwetin and Chilkatin people declared their opposition. Protests and legal challenges spearheaded the effort. It's the government and industry that is pushing us to stand up and protect our way of life. Marilyn and the Chilcotin National Government organized her community to present their case. We went through the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency and we are very thankful that we were able to have our voices heard. As a result, Canada's Environment Minister declared the report's findings scathing and the most condemning he had ever read. The federal government rejected the mine, but the mining company proposed an even more damaging plan and started bringing heavy equipment to the area. Maryland caught wind of it and sprang into action. And we have a legal mandate to conduct work. Do you want me to go through that, 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 that all that over again? There was a one-woman roadblock, putting a stop to a long train of men getting ready to go to work. I would recommend that you um, turn around and exit the territory. It was really amazing just to see her standing in her power, in her strength as a Chilcotin woman. And he drove right up to me, like as if he was going to run me over. And that kind of was a little threatening. 
didn't bother me, but it's just something that we had to do. Due to the efforts of Marilyn and her community, the British Columbia Supreme Court issued an injunction prohibiting any work on the mine. And the Canadian federal government again rejected the mine on environmental grounds. It's very significant to all indigenous peoples around the world. It means that governments, the courts, and industry can no longer deny our Aboriginal rights to practice our culture. Maryland's community continues efforts to teach the youth the traditional language, as well as the significance of native salmon. So at the final stages, we put the fish back into the river. Our elders and our children want these waters to remain clean and healthy for their great-grandchildren to be able to also drink from these waters. The shoreline of the island of Arran is dotted with scores of idyllic tourist villages. When Howard Wood started diving there 40 years ago, Arran's coastal waters were teeming with marine life, including cod, dab, and turbot. When I started diving for the first 10 years, on most dives, we would see an abundance of flatfish, these rays, these anglerfish. But within 10 or 15 years, we were lucky if we would see one every few months, and eventually we wouldn't see any at all. They used to have an angling competition in Lamlash Bay and to see who could catch the largest fish. And that had actually just withered and died, that competition, because there just weren't any fish left to catch. And I think that showed the devastating environmental impact of overfishing. Because Howard had spent so many years observing the conditions in Lamlash Bay from his unique underwater perspective, he could see clearly what was wreaking such havoc below the surface. Scallop dredging is one of the most destructive fishing methods in the whole of Europe, especially the version that we use in Scotland, which has four-inch tines that break through the seabed. They don't do one pass, they could do five, six over the same seabed. So there's very little survives. Howard began compiling data about the depleted marine ecosystem, sharing the information with friends and generating letters to government officials proposing a no-take zone in Lamlash Bay. Getting a, a protected area in Scotland on the instigation of the community had never been done. And we were told in government meetings that a no-take zone under present legislation was impossible. It is in a dire state. There were many meetings in the parliament, but the government officials and the big fishing industry were digging their heels in. Howard was resolute in his efforts to sway members of Scottish Parliament and the Fisheries Department. These are definitely divers. He co-founded Coast, the community of Arran Seabed Trust, and a wave of support continued to grow in both size and influence. And, you know, politicians, government, seldom listen to individuals. We will only change the government's mind. We had to hold meetings with the gardening club, the British Legion, every single club on the island. The few fishermen that we had on the island, we gathered them one day in the local pub. And they listened. By the end of the evening, maybe a couple of pints of beer helped, they'd agreed that they would support what we would like to do. So that was probably the largest hurdle on the island. As we built up community support, we found that the politicians that we'd be meeting with and trying to persuade they came on board. One of the most colourful fish we have in the UK. After 12 years of intense government engagement, in Wood's determination resulted in Scotland's first and only community developed no take zone at Lamlash Bay. Armed with extensive data that showed the dramatic recovery of the bay's marine life, Coast convinced Parliament to establish a vast 110 square mile marine protected area on the southern coast of Arran. This was quite a big moment because it meant that communities around Scotland should in future have a say in the waters that surround them. 
What's really exciting is that groups are springing up all over the west coast of Scotland and they're all looking at coast and thinking, we could do this. Each of these stories is another indication that individuals can make an important difference. It's inspiring to see what one person, armed with courage and commitment, can accomplish. I'm Robert Redford. Thank you for watching The New Environmentalists. Funding for The New Environmentalists was provided by the Goldman Environmental Prize, an award to honor and inspire grassroots environmental activism around the world.